Much of the extraordinary unrivaled success of America's space program of the 1960s can be attributed to the visionary brilliance and expertise of two physicists whose names are synonymous with rocketry and manned spaceflight, Dr. Hermann Oberth and Dr. Werner von Braun. Both of these men originally earned their stature in the field of rocket design by building ballistic missiles for Adolf Hitler's Third Reich during World War II. However, both of these men modestly admitted the spectacular success of their technical efforts was not theirs alone to claim. They had special assistance. Dr. Oberth cryptically stated, We cannot take the credit for our record advancement in certain scientific fields alone. We have been helped. When asked by whom, he replied, The people of other worlds. Dr. Von Braun candidly revealed his knowledge of extraterrestrials in 1959 by stating, We find ourselves faced by powers which are far stronger than hitherto assumed and whose base is at present unknown to us. More I cannot say at present. We are now engaged in entering into closer contact with those powers, and within six or nine months' time it may be possible to speak with more precision on the matter. Just who were the people of other worlds that Dr. Oberth spoke of so blithely, and were both of these esteemed German scientists making oblique reference to one of ufology's most pervasive and tantalizing myths, the alleged link between the Third Reich of pre-World War II Germany and extraterrestrials. Following the First World War, certain occult secret societies emerged in Germany intent upon the imminent arrival of the Aquarian Age, an age they believed would usher humanity into an era of spiritual and technological enlightenment and liberation. Members of these occult societies also believed that ancient lost civilizations once possessed technologies, long since forgotten to our modern understanding, that allowed them mastery of the seas and the skies and even interstellar space travel. Inspiration to rediscover such wondrous skills sprang from the pages of a novel published in 1871 by Rosicrucian author Edward Bulwer Lytton, entitled The Coming Race. Lytton tells the tale of an intrepid explorer who discovers an advanced race of humans living within a vast subterranean world who call themselves Vrilia. These beings had formerly been surface dwellers until a global catastrophe not unlike the Old Testament flood forced them to take refuge deep in the earth. The survival of this marvelous society was facilitated by their application of a force they referred to as Vril, or as Bulwer Lytton wrote, I should call it electricity except that it comprehends in its manifold branches other forces of nature to which, in our scientific nomenclature, differing names are assigned, such as magnetism, galvanism, etc. These people consider that in Vril they have arrived at the unity in natural energetic agencies, which has been conjectured by many philosophers above ground. It was supposed by some that Lytton's book was not altogether a work of fiction. As a student of arcane mysteries, he was privy to secrets that lost Lemurian and Atlantean artifacts still existed in clandestine caches hidden away in Tibet and the Gobi Desert. And indeed, ancient Sanskrit texts from India tell of great civilizations that flourished before the Great Flood that possessed technologies beyond the understanding of modern science. The epic poem Samarangana Sutradhara makes tantalizing reference to the construction of amazing flying machines. Strong and durable must the body of the Vimana be made, like a great flying bird of light material. Inside, one must put the mercury engine with its iron heating apparatus underneath. By means of power latent in the mercury, which sets the driving whirlwind in motion, a man sitting inside may travel a great distance in the sky. The movements of the Vimana are such that it can vertically ascend, 
vertically descend, or move slanting forwards and backwards. With the help of machines, human beings can fly through the air, and heavenly beings can come down to earth. German Oriental scholars and occultists of the Thule and Vril societies regarded such ancient myths as greatly significant, and during the lull between the First and Second World Wars, diligent efforts were put forth to seek out the source of this legendary energy and harness it as a viable technological reality. Mastery of such an occult force as Vril would not only assure German technical dominance, it would ultimately liberate Germany from any crippling codependence upon the international petroleum cartels dominated by Germany's conquerors, the United States and Britain. Initiates of both the Thule and Vril societies were determined to develop an alternative science and alternative technologies based on principles possessed by the great lost civilization of Atlantis, a spiritual dynamo technology superior to the mechanistic notions of modern science. Thus, to rediscover this source of universal free energy and make it readily available as a benefit to the modern world became their goal. Thule member and physics professor Dr. W. O. Schumann of the Technical University in Munich declared, In everything we recognize two principles that determine the events, light and darkness, good and evil, creation and destruction. As in electricity, we know plus and minus. It is always either or. Everything destructive is of satanic origin. Everything creative is divine. Every technology based on explosion or combustion has thus to be called satanic. The coming new age will be an age of new, positive, divine technology. Hence the goal to harness Brill, Prana, the fundamental limitless cosmic life force energy, a power source that would function harmoniously with our natural world, became an integral focus of these German secret societies. At the very heart of the Vril legend was a striking beauty named Maria Orsic. This gifted medium was leader of the Vrilarinen, a team of psychic girls serving the Vril Gesselschaft, who characteristically wore their hair in long horse tails, contrary to the popular bobbed hairstyles of that era. The ladies of the Vril actually claimed their long hair acted as cosmic antennas that helped facilitate their occult contact with beings from beyond. Presumably through a telepathic form of automatic writing, Maria Orsic made contact with an off-world civilization which was offering just the kind of alternative technology the German secret societies were looking for. As the legend goes, a fateful meeting was held in 1919 at an old hunting lodge near Berchtesgaden where Maria Orsic presented to a small group assembled from the Thule, Vril, and Black Sun societies telepathic messages she claimed to have received from an extraterrestrial civilization existing in the distant Aldebaran star system, 68 light years away in the constellation of Taurus. One set of Maria's channel transmissions was found to be in a German secret Templar script unknown to her. A second series of transmissions appeared to be written in an ancient Eastern language which Babylonian scholars within the Thule group recognized as ancient Sumerian. Maria Orsic, along with Zigrun, another of the Vril Society's female mediums, began the task of translating these transmissions and discovered they contained instructions for building a circular flying machine. It is worth noting here that the Vril Society traced its philosophical origins back to a secret Bavarian Gnostic Templar order styling itself as the Lords of the Black Stone, founded in 1221, an order steeped in ancient Babylonian and Sumerian theologies. Members of this Templar group displayed the winged bull for their symbol, an obvious reference to Taurus, and according to the order's archives, 
successful contact with beings from the Aldebaran star system may have occurred during the Middle Ages. If indeed a high-tech civilization actually existed in the Aldebaran star system, what would account for their possible motivation to assist the Vril Group and Germany to develop advanced technologies? Researcher Wendell Stevens tells us that, rather than a militant gesture of aid to aggressive Nazis, the Aldebarans perceived an economic disparity in Earth cultures that fueled perpetual wars and conflict. To alleviate this disparity, the Aldebarans reasoned that by offering free energy technologies used to create affordable mass transportation devices, a new innovative generation of industries promoting prosperity and greater peaceful interaction between nations might result, thus diminishing violent wars. Clearly such a plan resonated with the members of the Vril Society and their dream for a utopian new world based on alternative science. Upon studying these otherworldly designs, Dr. W. O. Schumann and his associates from the University of Munich and the Thule Society realized the channeling actually contained viable physics, and over the ensuing years, construction was initiated to make this flying machine a reality. By 1922, development of a working prototype was underway. Although the first manned disc crashed in its maiden flight, a redesigned 5-meter RFZ-2 was successfully test flown in 1934 and eventually flying disc development was taken over by Division SSE-4 of Hitler's Third Reich. Inspired by the utopian visions of both Thule and Vril society ideals, Adolf Hitler rose to political power under the swastika banner of Germany's National Socialist Party. Yet despite his professed aim to create a world of cosmic harmony, Hitler plunged Europe into the altogether destructive Second World War by sending his panzer tank divisions and infantry into Poland in 1939. And although all German secret societies were outlawed by the Nazi party, the Thule and Vril Gesellschafts maintained their autonomy, and development of Vril levitating saucer craft continued despite funding competition from conventional Luftwaffe war production imperatives. Aerotechnical Unit V7 designed a number of hybrid saucers that combined both exotic anti-gravity and conventional turbojet propulsion systems, creating vertical lift craft that were essentially precursors to modern helicopters. Although some of these bizarre designs were successfully flown, they earned dubious reputations as clumsy gas hogs that spent more time in maintenance than actually flying. However, the anti-gravity Vril designs demonstrated more efficiency. It is important to note that the Vril craft did not fly in the traditional sense. Like huge gyroscopes, these craft levitated by generating their own discrete gravitational fields. Thus, the distinctly separate highly classified SSE-4 unit for the sole secret responsibility of developing Hitler's dream of free energy flight machines. By 1941 the successful Vril-2 levitation craft was employed for transatlantic reconnaissance flights. This craft employed the Schumann levitator drive for vertical lift and when activated the craft displayed effects commonly described in many UFO accounts. Blurring of visible contours and luminous ionization colors relative to the craft's engine acceleration, varying from orange to green, blue to white. As well, the craft made radical 90-degree turns characteristic of UFO flight. Tragically, the Reich diverted the peaceful intent of the Aldebaran levitation technology, and following the success of the RFZ-2, a single pilot combat model was designed. The advanced Real one Jaeger fighter was capable of 12,000 km per hour and amazing full-speed right-angle turns with no adverse GFX on the pilot. Since the craft flew in a self-contained envelope of its own gravitational field, the pilot experienced no sense of motion or inertia. Subsequent levitation craft advances between 1941 and 1944 spawned the Hanibu series the heavy hitters of the Reich's saucer fleet. 
driven by powerful tachyon magnetogravitic engines called Thule tachyonators, speculated to be large spherical containers of mercury spinning around a vertical axis, these armored saucer ships of varying size came equipped with armaments such as panzer tank cannon turrets mounted to the underside as well as klystron laser cannons. By Christmas of 1943, medium Maria Orsic of the Vril Gesellschaft claimed that subsequent transmissions from Aldebaran reveal there were two habitable planets orbiting that star, and that the ancient Mesopotamian civilization of Sumeria was linked to earlier colonies of Aldebaran explorers. The seers discovered that the Aldebaran written language was identical to that of the Sumerians and was phonetically similar to that of spoken German. It was also revealed that a dimension channel or wormhole existed connecting our two solar systems. Thus, in January of 1944, possibly aware that Germany's war efforts were faltering, Adolf Hitler and his deputy, Heinrich Himmler, authorized an audacious plan to send a real seven saucer ship into the dimensional channel, perhaps to secure assistance from the Aldebaran civilization. The venture resulted in near disaster. The real seven returned with its hull reportedly aged as if it had been flying for a hundred years and it surfaced damage in several places. Meanwhile the Allies sampled an unpleasant taste of deadly weapons potential of German saucers. In 1944 a massive bombing raid was launched against the critical ball bearing plant at Schweinfurt. Within a matter of hours a squadron of 10 to 15 Nazi discs managed to obliterate as many as 150 British and American bombers, one quarter of the entire bomber contingent. Two techniques were employed against the vast bomber squadron. One involved a device called a motor stopple, a klystron ray gun which caused the Allied aircraft engines to simply shut down. The other was to infuse the atmosphere ahead of the bombers with a highly flammable aerosol which exploded as the planes with their internal combustion engines flew into it. However, despite such tactical success, the Germans did not press this technological advantage to secure ultimate victory. With the military fate of the Reich in doubt, an ambitious, energetic general rose within the SS inner circle elite to a level of power that rivaled perhaps even that of the Fuhrer himself. Hans Kammler, a protege of Heinrich Himmler, the SS Chief of Staff, had earned a reputation with his skills for rapid deployment and implementation of underground manufacturing facilities and vast mobilization of slave labor consignments from concentration camps. By 1945, Kammler had secured control over all top-secret SS projects that were missile or aircraft related. Certainly, real projects would have been one of his foremost priorities. A cunning, shrewd, and lethal opportunist, Kammler easily bore the qualifications to mastermind construction of an emergency refuge of the South Pole, the last untamed continent on the planet. And as of April 17, 1945, Kammler disappeared from Germany, presumably escaping capture aboard a lumbering six-engine Junkers 390 America bomber bound for an unknown destination. Neither was military assistance forthcoming from Aldebaran, but perhaps safe haven was offered instead, as a massive 250-foot diameter Hanibu III dreadnought armed with four heavy caliber naval turrets and capable of space flight was allegedly completed by April of 1945. With the specter of Russian, British, and American armies all relentlessly advancing on the German heartland, supplies, scientists, and saucer components were being steadily evacuated from Europe by U-boat to secret enclaves in Germany's Antarctic colony, Neuschwabenland, a vast tract of land at the South Pole which had been annexed by Germany in 1938. Just one month prior to the Hanibu III's completion, a cryptic message was sent by Maria Orsic to all members of the Vril Society, simply stating, None are staying here. The psychic medium Maria was never heard from again, perhaps having escaped, like Kamler, to South America, the Antarctic, or possibly even Aldebaran. 
By inevitably seizing the rocket facilities and personnel at Pinamunda, the advancing Allied Army leadership was only too well aware of how dangerously advanced German technology had become. Despite the Third Reich's unconditional surrender in 1945, a potential Nazi threat still haunted Allied intelligence. Had the German High Command sacrificed its European operation to buy time for installation of a fallback position in the Antarctic, capable of launching future retaliations from its South Polar Redoubt? A key component to this legend is the account of Operation High Jump. In January of 1947, Secretary of the Navy James Forrestal ordered that an American military task force, complete with 13 ships, including an aircraft carrier, seaplanes, helicopters, and 4,000 combat troops, be dispatched to the Antarctic under the command of Admiral Richard E. Byrd for the stated purpose of mapping the coastline. This task force was provisioned for an eight-month polar stay, and though Byrd's group did discover fresh water, thermal heated lakes, as well as vast coal deposits, no mention of a Nazi presence ever made the official record. However, after only eight weeks and an undisclosed loss of planes and personnel, Byrd withdrew his forces. According to rumor, Byrd encountered overwhelming hostile action he described as fighters that are able to fly from one pole to another with incredible speed. He also intimated that he had engaged a German contingent, being assisted as well by an advanced civilization with formidable technologies. Full details of what occurred with Byrd's expedition remain shrouded in mystery. After extensive debriefing at the Pentagon, Byrd was ordered to keep silent about his experiences at the South Pole. Also, it should be noted that two years later, in 1949, Admiral Byrd's superior, James Forrestal, was sent to convalesce for a nervous breakdown at Bethesda Naval Hospital in Washington, D.C. However, after allegedly ranting to hospital staff about the Antarctic, UFOs, and an underground Nazi city, Forrestal was denied all visitors and shortly thereafter died in a fall from his 16th floor hospital room window. His death was labeled a suicide. But again, considering the question posed at the outset of this essay, could the advanced civilization suggested by Byrd be the same extraterrestrials alluded to by both von Braun and Oberth? Could these people of other worlds be Germany's mysterious allies from Aldebaran? Such is the legend of Vril and the Third Reich's levitating disc projects. Of course, had all discussion of flying saucers ended in 1945, it would be perfectly simple to dismiss the whole myth as preposterous nonsense. However, as we well know, persistent reports of UFOs and circular flying craft have remained a ubiquitous enigma worldwide for all the decades since World War II. And as long as this mystery goes unanswered, the riddle of Nazi saucers remains an urgent paradox that spins a kaleidoscope of demanding questions. Viewed from the aspect of classical physics, the whole myth is easily dismissed as fanciful rubbish. The lurid, tabloid notions of occult channeling the Space Brothers from Aldebaran and Nazis armed with flying saucers and ray guns sounds like the most outrageous science fiction. However, this same legend, reconsidered from the radically altered view of quantum physics, takes on dramatic plausibility. Was the Vril Society simply making practical application of the unified field? Is Vril, or the Unity and Natural Energetic Agencies, that Edward Bulwer Lytton described, far from pulp fiction, but a remarkably accurate description of zero-point energy that pervades the entire universe. Did ancient lost civilizations of Earth share understanding with extraterrestrial civilizations among the stars that the universe is in fact an ocean of limitless energy? Could it be that a handful of daring German visionaries discovered secrets of harnessing this energy and ultimately, who were the real victors in World War II? Did a contingent of German physicists and engineers and military personnel successfully drop off the grid in 1945 and establish a new colony totally self-sufficient and independent of the global petroleum cartels? And are the fundamentals of free energy production fully known and deliberately withheld at the cost of destroying our environment 
merely to serve the greed of multinational corporate and banking interests to this day. And is this free energy propulsion the ultimate secret behind the UFO cover-up? Of course, in the years immediately following World War II, the German saucer mystery compounded even more. In June of 1947, a private pilot named Kenneth Arnold reported seeing a formation of nine shiny objects speeding along at an unprecedented speed of 1,600 miles per hour in the vicinity of Mount Rainier, Washington. In Arnold's words, the craft flew like a saucer would if you skipped it across the water. Seizing upon his words, the press launched a tabloid fascination with flying saucers. However, Arnold described the craft he saw as actually crescent-shaped, like flying wings, which coincidentally was another air form perfected by the German Horton brothers during the war. It was suspected that captured German aircraft were being studied in a joint United States-British facility in western Canada, close to Washington State. Four months later, in September of 1947, just eight months after Admiral Byrd's aborted mission to the Antarctic, the Strategic Air Command undertook a detailed mapping and reconnaissance mission of the North Pole. An extensive B-29 support base was established at Fort Richardson, Alaska. But aside from cameras, these bombers were crammed with state-of-the-art electromagnetic scanners, sensors, and magnetic emissions detectors. And, just as Byrd described, High-speed craft, capable of flying from pole to pole, were again encountered at the Arctic as well. Debrief flight crews reported seeing metallic, vertical lift saucers parked on the ice packs, flying in and out of the water, as well as dogging the B-29s. All evidence, tapes, film canisters, and documentation were immediately classified and rushed back to Washington, D.C. According to the captured records, the Germans also had construction plans for a Zeppelin-sized levitating cylinder ship called the Andromeda Machine. This 330-foot behemoth was capable of carrying as many as three of the smaller Vril and Haunibu scout ships. In the early 1950s, a California man named George Adamski photographed a UFO remarkably similar to this design. Later, Adamski claimed to have contact with a Nordic-looking extraterrestrial near Desert Center, California, who claimed to be from the planet Venus. However, it should be noted that photographs of the little scout craft this alien flew showed a design virtually identical to the German Hanibu II. Although Adamski was later debunked as a fraud, reports of UFOs identical to the Venusian scout ship continued to surface worldwide. In 1954, President Dwight Eisenhower was allegedly secreted away to a meeting with extraterrestrials at Murak Airfield near Palm Springs, California. One particular group was reported to be Nordic-looking, and they offered Eisenhower free energy technology in exchange for nuclear disarmament. Ike declined. And as the story goes, these Nordic ETs subsequently met with Pope Pius XII at the Vatican as well. And, of course, it remains common knowledge that during the war, Germany had cordial relations with Argentina and other Latin American countries. And by a curious coincidence, even today, UFOs are commonly reported the full length and breadth of South America, along with tales of hidden German bases in the ice peaks of Peru and the vast jungles of Brazil. But perhaps the most blatant inference of a German connection with UFOs comes from the famed Billy Meyer case in Switzerland. In 1975, 30 years after the disappearance of the Vril Society leaders, a Swiss farmer claimed to have contact with a girl from the Pleiades who bore the pseudonym Semyasi and a striking resemblance to the Vril Orionin from 1919. This space girl also wore long blonde hair, spoke in fluent Austrian German, and candidly shared comprehensive knowledge about the German saucer projects of the Third Reich. Were Semyasi's beam ships actually modern versions of the old Hanibus? And yet the riddle remains that if a surviving generation of Germans actually thrives under the Antarctic ice today, armed with vastly superior technology, why then would they not simply flex their muscle and conquer the world in one final swift stroke? Could it be they've learned that such a conquest might be a futile gesture? 
Suppose the Reich survivors learn from their Aldebaran mentors, a secret known to the ancient Sumerians, that in a regular 3600 year cycle, the surface of planet Earth is devastated by the passing of a dwarf star, which is companion to our solar system, and that this dark star was calculated once again to swing through the inner planets during the early years of the 21st century. Such a monumental event would grant the thousand year Reich a meager 70 year or so lifespan. Thus, might the Reich survivors not wisely choose to disappear from the surface world and develop hardened underground shelters in remote wastes of the Antarctic, patiently preparing to safely ride out the dark star's passing? Do we dare suppose that a contemporary generation of subterranean Reichskinder secretly continue to advance their limitless scientific wonders, content to allow the ignorant, expendable surface dwellers to choke in the poison atmosphere of their internal combustion, junk technology, automobiles, airplanes, and industries. Could it be that all the incredible levitating machines and free energy technologies envisioned by the Thule and Vril societies are being carefully held in reserve for the promised new age, a future time when Earth has recovered from the agonies of the dark star's encounter? We may discover the answers to these questions sooner than we realize. Meanwhile, the quest to solve the mysteries of Nazi saucers and the secrets from Aldebaran certainly has gained more relevance to our present world here in the first decade of the 21st century. It seems an irony that, much like pre-World War II Germany, we find Western civilization dangerously dependent upon foreign petroleum sources dominated by hostile Muslim nations. Is there a free energy, anti-gravity answer to this dilemma? To conclude this essay, I must caution this story is virtually all legend. There is little or no hard evidence to fully verify the authenticity of this tale. The conjecture offered here is cobbled together from the writings of Jan von Helsing, Vladimir Trzyski, Nick Cook, Timothy Good, Wendell Stevens, and a website called Gray Falcon, as well as the video UFO Secrets of the Third Reich. The bottom line has two options. Either the whole story is pure fantasy, or Nazi secrets of anti-gravity were gobbled up at the end of the war by Allied intelligence and given a security classification above top secret, with all evidence meticulously hidden or destroyed. However, it should be noted that anti-gravity propulsion systems such as the Vril legend suggests would make all aerospace and avionic technologies obsolete overnight. And these are huge multi-billion dollar industries directly tied to the international petroleum cartels. Surely these combined military-industrial interests would possess the means and the motive to obliterate any conclusive history of German anti-gravity research. Allegedly, the Rockefeller Foundation paid $139,000 in 1946 to commission the publishing of an official history of World War II that deleted any and all references to the mystical and occult interests of the Third Reich. One of the Rockefeller Foundation's major contributors was Standard Oil. And as a final postscript, I must offer the mystery of the TR-3B aircraft. Allegedly one of the latest high-tech stealth flying machines engineered by the United States Defense Department. And rumored to be presently operational is the Astra, otherwise known as the TR-3B. This astounding craft is delta-shaped and comes in two sizes, one 300 feet long and another 600 feet long. The Astra is capable of vertical lift and all the other radical moves typically associated with UFOs. Its propulsion is described as magnetic field disruptor, i.e. anti-gravity, created by spinning mercury plasma at 50,000 RPMs, pressurized to 250,000 PSI. This reduces the craft's gravitational mass by 89%. Multi-mode impulse rockets at each corner of the delta configuration supply the remaining 11% propulsion. Could this plane be the modern stepchild of the Hanibu 3? Thus the Aldebaran mystery comes full circle to the Vril Society's original fascination with lost technologies from antiquity. For according to the ancient Sanskrit texts, the name Astra refers to a terrible airborne weapon.